There is a proposal in Indiana to change the Constitution to ban same-sex marriage. When asked why HJR 6 is necessary, some reply, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I suppose this is some attempt to call us back to biblical family values. Adam and Eve, so the story goes, were the only two people on earth. They had two sons. After Cain killed Abel, he moved east of Eden to take a wife. What was this wife if she was not human? Later in Genesis, Abraham marries his half-sister Sarah, lets her sleep with Pharaoh for political reasons, and when Sarah could not bear children, he had sex with her slave Hagar. When Sarah did have a son, Isaac, Abraham attempted to sacrifice him to God. Later, in the story of Jacob, he married Leah and had kids with her even though he wanted her sister Rachel. So he married her also. He had two wives and twelve kids who fathered the twelve tribes of Israel. King David was married when he saw another man's wife bathing. She sent that woman's husband to the front lines of battle to die so he could have her. Their son, King Solomon, had 700 wives, which apparently were not enough because he also had 300 concubines. Jesus was single. He forbid divorce and said nothing about homosexuality. According to the book of Mark, when he was arrested, there was a young man clad only in a sheet that ran away naked. The Apostle Paul argues against the marriage for single people, but said it was better to marry than to burn if they could not control their passion. Now, the Bible also has passages advocating monogamy and forbidding adultery, yet it's difficult to find a major biblical figure who lives by these rules. Moses married Zipporah, and there are no tales of infidelity or other wives. However, his sister Miriam and brother Aaron complained that his wife was a Cushite, now, a Cushite in Bible speak is a person from Africa. And this is a place in the Bible where I think the punishment fit the crime. Um, Miriam was struck down with leprosy, which turned her skin white. It's as if God was saying, Moses' wife isn't white enough for you? Well, I'm going to make you even whiter. So perhaps Aaron and Miriam were going objecting to interracial marriage, which has also been objected to in the United States. Interracial marriage was illegal in Indiana until 1965, and it was finally overturned nationally in all states by the Supreme Court decision Virginia v. Loving in 1967. People would cite the Bible which forbid the Hebrew children from marrying any of the women they conquered. Others said it just ain't natural. People had in their notions of what marriage should be and who were permitted to fall in love. The interracial ban was based on social prejudice and defended on religious grounds. The case is similar with same-sex marriage. It is based on social prejudice and defended on religious grounds. Because the Bible also calls eating shrimp and pork an abomination. But there are no proposals for making a constitutional amendment prohibiting it. Jesus forbids divorce, yet it remains legal in Indiana. Polygamy abounds in the Bible, yet Utah had to ban it in order to obtain statehood. Those who claim to object to same-sex marriages on religious grounds are hypocrites unless they advocate for all the provisions of the Bible. Including this tidbit from Deuteronomy 22, 
If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay the girl's father fifty shekels of silver. He must marry the girl, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. So if this little girl gets pregnant, not only is she forced to carry the baby to term, she must marry the rapist. That is some weird expression of God's providence. Some will argue that we cannot follow all the ancient Hebrew laws because times have changed. I agree. And it is time to change the laws forbidding same-sex marriage. Now, there are some marriage prohibitions that still make some sense to me. It seems that some people are too young to be married. Now, other cultures have child marriages, but in America we have tried to protect children from sex and marriage. But these laws are pretty arbitrary. We haven't figured out what the exact age is that someone is mature enough. I know people who are in their 50s who probably aren't mature enough to be married. The age of sexual consent in the United States ranges from 16 to 18 in various states. The age of consent in Indiana is 16. But one must be 18 to marry without the parent's permission. So if you put these two laws together, it seems to promote premarital sex for two years before allowing people to marry of their own accord. It's worse in Mississippi where the legal age to marry is 21, but the age of consent is 16. Thus people are legally allowed to have sex for five years before marrying. Though there is a general sense that people should wait until they are old enough to fall in love, the laws themselves are arbitrary. And there is another prohibition that makes some scientific sense. When people are too closely related, their offspring are likely to have genetic birth defects if both are carrying recessive genes. Twenty states allow first cousins to marry and 23 states forbid first cousins to marry. Now, Indiana allows first cousin marriage if both are over 65. So if you have a hot cousin, all you have to do is wait. And if waiting to age 65 is too long, slip across the border to Illinois where you only have to be 50. Or, if one of you is unable to reproduce, first cousins can marry in Illinois, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Utah. I find it interesting that not being able to, re to reproduce is a requirement for marriage in four states, while one of the arguments against same-sex marriage is that people of the same gender cannot reproduce in a conventional marriage manner. If the ability for natural born children is the reason for marriage, then heterosexual couples who are unable to have kids should also be forbidden to marry. But marriage is more than the ability to have children. Adoption is an option for couples unable to reproduce. According to the statistics from the Human Rights Campaign, only 18 states in Washington, D.C., allow same-sex couples to adopt. 18 states and the District of Columbia allow same-sex couples to adopt through single-parent adoption, which allows one parent to adopt the child while the partner petitions to become a second guardian. Same-sex couples in eight additional states have successfully petitioned courts for second parish adoption in some jurisdictions. But when it comes to state statutes, Mississippi is the lone state with specific law barring same-sex couples from adopting a child. Indiana, single people are allowed to adopt regardless of sexual orientation. 
California was the first state to allow single parent adoption back in the 60s. Now all states allow it. I cite these examples because the definition of marriage and family are evolving and changing. We are moving from a system that is rigid and based on religion and property laws and ethnic categories, and the emphasis is shifting to personal choice. No one should be forced to marry or forced to stay in a marriage. People should be allowed to choose their partner. The time is now. Mutual consent should be the overriding moral concern. The government should remain neutral on matters of religion. People who choose a certain religion may choose to follow the marital rules of that religion, but the government should not enforce them. We have certain politicians who say they want to shrink government. They say they want government off of their backs. Yet they seem to want government small enough to fit in your underwear. Same-sex marriage is banned by law in Indiana, but some want to enshrine this discrimination in the Indiana Constitution. HJR 6 has passed the legislature once, it needs to pass a second time to be placed on the ballot. Currently, it's stalled while the legislature waits for the Supreme Court to decide on the California same-sex marriage ban. They want to make sure that the language is congruent with that decision. But the pause in the political action at this time does not mean we can pause in our action. We need to talk with others about why same-sex marriage is okay. Gay couples must come out to the degree which it is comfortable and safe. Employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity are illegal, but still occurs under other pretenses, and violence is always possible. Because of this, it is most important that straight allies use their freedom. Talk of the gay and lesbian couples you know. I know a couple in North Carolina that have been together for over 40 years. They are veterans. We have friends who have raised a son. They have a very domestic life. So domestic that one of them told me, we're here, we're queer, we're just as boring as you. The more we can introduce gay people as human beings, the harder it is for people to whip up fear. When one tries to discriminate against anyone, the strategy is to group them together and say they're trying to take over. They speak ominously of a gay agenda, as if there was a secret meeting held in a bathhouse where perversions were invented and recruitment drives organized. But we need to let people know that gay lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people are individuals. And their individual agendas are similar to many heterosexual individuals. They want to fall in love, get married, and grow old together. That's it. The scary gay agenda is surprisingly wholesome. If one is worried about gay promiscuity, one should encourage same-sex marriage. If one is worried about straight promiscuity, one should encourage straight marriage. But marriage is not for everyone. Some have tried it and decided never again. Some try it over and over again without success. And some decide never to make the commitment. But each person Everyone should be free to make their own decision. It's a personal decision. Each relationship is special. As long as it's consenting adults, the government should not interfere. Let love have a chance to bloom.